This morning's sermon's title, I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. <laughs> I'm doing my best to make it in. Are you doing your best to make it in? We can't make it in without the power of vision. And that is the title of this morning's message, the power of vision, the power of vision. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you and praise you that we don't perpetually have to climb up the rough side of the mountain. In fact, you tell us as we do some climbing, we need to do some speaking too. You say in your word that we need to speak to our mountains also as we are climbing. We need to say to them, be thou removed, particularly if our mountains are hindrances and that which is meant to oppress us and suppress our witness. You say, speak to the mountain and it shall be moved. But we cannot speak to the mountain. We cannot climb up the rough side of mountains if we have no vision. So God, teach us about the importance of vision, which is the seventh mark of a vital congregation, according to the Vital Congregations Initiative. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. And you are our redeemer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I believe it was Victor Hugo who said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea or a vision whose time has come. Saul's vision was all messed up though. And the more the self-proclaimed Pharisee of Pharisees thought he could see, the worse his vision seemed to be. In a strange paradox, the fact is that when Saul could see physically and religiously at the same time, he was blind spiritually and religiously. As Saul is rounding up Christians, he had blinders on. He was locked into his role as a Pharisee, as a persecutor of God's church, a persecutor of the Jesus movement. What was his problem? He was operating from a warped vision. He erroneously thought that his calling, his life's work, was all about punishing and incarcerating and brutalizing people who did not subscribe to the legalism and hypocrisy of the temple industrial religious complex. Their leaders had a certain interpretation of the will of God and many did not subscribe to that interpretation. And he was so incensed to the point that he was having families, men and women, and probably their children too, arrested and imprisoned because he thought it was the will of God to punish people into submission. But a great shift of vision occurred in his life when he suddenly became blinded physically and religiously. It was then and only then that he began to see he began to see that he was hurting the heart of God and going against the will of God as he brought the people of God into bondage and suffering. Sisters and brothers, Saul did not see until the heavenly ophthalmologist showed up as a bright light and did a spiritual procedure on his vision. In verse 3, Luke writes that Dr. Jesus shined a bright light on Saul, the light of his own resurrected presence. And he was a light so bright that it caused Saul to then question all that he had seen before as he temporarily lost his physical sight in the brightness of the glory of God. Sisters and brothers, many times in order to see better spiritually, we have to lose our old understanding, our old perspective, our old paradigms. The prophet Isaiah testified that it was in the year that Uzziah, King Uzziah died. And Uzziah was a good king. Uzziah was a godly king. 
Uzziah was a beloved king and he was good friends with Isaiah. But it was at that time when Uzziah died that then Isaiah's vision was enhanced. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. Have you ever had to give up your old perspective, one that you leaned on, one that you operated out of, some old way of thinking, some old way of perceiving, some old way of believing, but you had to let it go. You had to let go of some of your former presuppositions so that you could really see what God was trying to do in your life today. This, this, this was Saul's experience. Consequently, how he had understood God, how he had understood himself, how he understood the faith as he understood society and the people of God. All of that shifted in one of the greatest conversion stories that has ever happened and take place, taken place in human history. An enemy of the church becomes a champion of the church overnight. Sisters and brothers, as we think about Saul, who becomes Paul the apostle, and as we think about this time in history and our need for godly vision that we might fulfill our righteous destinies, how is your vision this morning? How, how's your vision? How are you perceiving your reason for being in the world? Why is God allowing you to see another year? In what ways are your religious and your moral and your ethical and societal perceptions on target or off target? Are, are your perceptions skewed or are they on point? B better yet, how would you know? If you have been viewing yourself, others, and even this church and other churches and your God in a way that is on point or warped and out of focus. And that you are in need of corrective work offered by the spirit who is our divine ophthalmologist. How, how would you know? Or, or perhaps like Saul seemed to think, you think that, listen, the way I, my outlook is showing up in my life, the way I'm looking at things, everything is fine. Everything is all together well, and I don't need any eye work. Is that you? Or do you need some eye work? Is your vision just fine? Or could your vision be enhanced? You think you know your God, yourself? You think you know how the world turns very well? And so besides the ordinary hiccups in your life, you have made, you think you have it made in the shade. As you sip on your church lemonade, as you recline, wine, and dine all the time. Could, could it really be that you need your vision checked? Could it be that eye diseases have snuck up on us and snuck up on you and me and we are lacking the kind of insight and foresight that God desires us to have so we can be who we were meant to be for a lost and dying world? Well, I think that Jesus and Saul are stopping by on this first Sunday in May to challenge you and me to get our vision checked out. Hear what the greatest expert on human sight and insight has to say on the subject of our spiritual vision. And to teach us, he uses physical vision as an analogy for seeing spiritually. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23 are the verses I'm return, referring to. You can look it up on your own. In these two verses, Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, Jesus, that master teacher, said that the lamp, the light of our physical selves is our eyes or is the eye. And when our eyes are healthy, when our eyes are clear, when our perception of the world around us is as it should be, we see wonderful colors, we see great shapes, we see details, we have good depth perception. And when our vision is clear spiritually, because he's using physical sight as an analogy, he said we see God, ourselves and our neighbors through a Holy Spirit touched lens. Our perception is clear and we are filled with a powerful gift. We can see. We have light. 
and our visual apparatus is flooded with light, he says. And that light is not just for us, but it helps us to move and function in our world. And it helps us to see others, who they really are. That light of perception helps us to relate to others lovingly and graciously and truthfully and appropriately and from a vantage point of godliness. Are you in godly relationships? Do you view the folk around you as being godly? And that light of inner vision can operate in a way that helps us to illuminate the shadowy pathways of those who might be in our circles of influence who have not yet seen the light. In this way, we can see and we, the church, become a light of the world, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. Helping others to see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of God. But Jesus says, conversely, when our eyes, our vision is not healthy. And when our vision is obscured physically or spiritually, we cannot see as we should. And when we can't see as we should, we cannot help others as we should. After all, there is a well-known maxim in the gospel where Jesus talks about the blind leading the blind. If the blind lead the blind, both are going to fall in a ditch, he says. In fact, in this text, Jesus at this point moves beyond just using an analogy regarding how our physical eyes work. But he's laying or he is saying that if our inner vision is messed up spiritually, messed up by bad religion, messed up with bad religion, which leads to a bad psychology, messed up by unconfessed sin and an eagerness to embrace bitterness and to blame others for all your troubles. Have you ever met somebody, their disposition just seemed like they drank pickle juice and lemon juice at the same time, and then they ran out to encounter you, and they got up in your face, and you could just perceive that bitterness eking out of them? When we stew in our bitterness and blame others for all our troubles, our eyesight is messed up. If we spend most of our time judging others too harshly as we excuse ourselves too quickly and easily, then our vision is messed up. Then there will be an inward darkness. Because while we are intently looking at the specks of sawdust in our neighbor's eyes, we do not perceive and even notice the two by fours from Lowe's and Menards that are in our own eyes. And when we lack powerful and godly insight and foresight, we are going to be very limited in our ability to know God for real and know ourselves for real and really anyone for that matter. Because we will be deluded by delusions. Jesus said that when the light that is in us the mode of revelation, the means of revelation that is in us when the insight we have working in our minds and hearts is not healthy. Have you known folk who claim to know the motives of other people? They claim as they accuse others of trying to steal from them or set them up to fail. They claim to have discernment as to why someone is behaving the way that they are behaving because they think they have light. If the person tends not to be a trusting individual or it tends to be suspicious and grew up in a home where everybody was suspicious of each other or they, they, they won't own up to their own stuff. Then they will have moments of insight because that's the way the human mind and heart work. There's still going to be some insight that will come. But the source of that insight will come from a place of spiritual darkness and deception and might lead to paranoia. Okay, let me flesh this out a bit since we're talking about vision. When I was a new student at Jarvis Christian College, I started at Jarvis Christian College in Hawkins, Texas, my second year. I had done some community college work in Chicago, and then I went off to Hawkins, Texas. And I joined the Student Ministers Association, and I became vice president uh, my first year. At that time, the college had just hired a new campus minister or a dean of chapel. 
He was a brother, an African brother with a heavy accent, but he was a kind brother. He was a nice brother. As he and I got to know each other, it soon became apparent that he was not very trusting of people. He was not very trusting of the administrators, the school president, the dean of students, and other students, perhaps because of his accent. I don't know. But he used to tell me incessantly, Gregory, Gregory, I don't think the president likes me. And so we would talk. I would ask him why not. And what he said didn't seem to make sense. I'm not sure if the dean of students likes me. I'm not sure if the students think that I'm competent. Well, he kept talking like that out of a sense of insecurity and suspicion until by the end of the year, what he thought and imagined would happen, happened. He got fired. He got replaced. His view of himself and others set in motion a self-fulfilling prophecy. We've got to be careful about our inner perception and outer perception. Jesus said to avoid Saul's state in Acts chapter 9 as he sought to get rid of Christians who saw who he saw as a great threat. We must make sure that we are moving, removing rather, that we are removing that plank out of our field of vision first, first, so that then secondarily we can see clearly who's who and what's what and how God is moving where we stand. Jesus said that if we want to operate from a good inner vision first, we've got to deal with the two by four lodged in our eyes. So that we can then secondarily properly help the neighbors get that irritating bit of sawdust out of their eyes. Because sawdust doesn't belong in your eyes either. When the way we perceive the world and other people and ourselves and our God is off the mark and off the wall like Saul's first vision was for whatever reason. Jesus said that the result is that we will eventually become filled with spiritual darkness. And then he raises not as a question, but he makes a statement saying, how deep is that darkness? Like if you don't get it right, there's no bottom to that pit. This thing about how we see ourselves, how we see our neighbor, our world, and especially our God is critical for good spiritual health and satisfaction as we deal with the individual self. It is important that each one of us allows the divine ophthalmologist to correct our vision individually as we prayerfully meditate in the mirror of God's word day and night. Because God's word reveals to us the truth of who we are and who other people are and who God is. If we don't meditate in the word of God, James said, it's like we're leaving out and we forget who we really are. And in the process, we don't really have good discernment about where other people are coming from. But we can't stop with the individual self. The same is true for the community of faith. In fact, the work of becoming healthier individually and together as a church by clarifying our vision and mission is described as the seventh and final mark of a vital congregation because vital congregations are led by and filled with servant members who are seeking God's vision for their lives together. They are praying about together and they are listening out for God's flashes of insight together so that we can become fulfilled together. I don't know about you, but I suspect it is true for you too. Individually, I don't want to go through life misperceiving and misunderstanding and misjudging who I am and who we are because my vision is cloudy and dark. Nor should we be comfortable as a church body, as a corporate body. We're trying to be the authentic church without pursuing together God's vision as a congregation. The, the more mature I become, and I've got a ways to go, the more I want to see better, even as my physical sight seems to be diminishing more and more every year. 
The other day I dropped something on the floor in my kitchen and I didn't have on my glasses and I looked down. I couldn't tell whether I was looking at dust or whether I looked at I was looking at what I dropped. I said, Lord, what happened to my eyesight? It just comes with age. But the older I get, I don't want to continue to misunderstand life and I don't want to see churches misunderstanding who God is calling them to be. The older I get, the more I want congregations in our communities to finally get on with living into God's given vision for that church. God desires to give every and each congregation that declares that Jesus is Lord a vision. Because without proper vision... The Bible says that people perish or another, a better translation says the people will cast off all restraints. People will do whatever they want to do if there's no unifying vision. Vibrant congregations operate in light of a powerful vision, a dream of what God intends for the congregation to focus on as their raison d'etre, their reason for being. You know, uh, behavioral scientists did a study. They did a study where they wanted to see, and I shared this with the Bible study class, they wanted to see how would human beings walk? Could they walk in a straight line if they were blindfolded? So they took these, um, these uh, participants out to a field and they blindfolded them so well where they couldn't even see light. And they asked them to walk in a straight line, as straight as they could. And for a while, they did pretty good. But without fail, as they started trekking forward, eventually they would start curving until they ended up walking in a large circle over and over. And what the behavioral scientists realized after they accounted for, well, is one foot longer than the other one? Is one person more top heavy than the other one? After they took into account all of those differentiations, they noticed that really what was at work was when you blindfold somebody, you take away their ability to have a visual reference in the distance so that they cannot see how to walk straight and will end up walking in circles. And sisters and brothers, that's a good analogy for us as the church. Without a vision in front of us, we will end up spinning our wheels in circles. As I grow and mature, I want to perceive more clearly than I did years ago and even months ago. Don't you? Individually and as a congregation. Can, can I testify for a moment? You want to know what I see? Before all is said and done and I leave this life, I want to see the accomplishment of all that God has called me to do. I envision saying what God would have me to say, whatever that is, and write whatever God would have me to write, whatever that is for his glory. I envision that God would pray, have me to pray whatever God would have me to pray. That God would have me to form love-based relationships with whomsoever God would have me to walk and work with and play with. Mutually beneficial and holy godly relationships as iron sharpens iron. Amen. And as I look at myself, I want to discern my growth in the Lord both in love and obedience and steadfastness. I want to see God moving decisively in my life but then more broadly multiculturally but especially among those kissed long by nature's son i would guess that you do too do you want to see god moving in your life decisively moving moving decisively in your day-to-day -day dealings with others in ways that testify that you are a child of god and you're not playing games with the devil in your life you're a person who loves God and loves your community. Do you have that kind of personal vision? You love your people and all who are oppressed and have lost hope. You and me should want to see how we can infuse our people with a better self-perception and God perception so that those who have been the most maligned, the most criticized, the most caricatured, the most oppressed and stereotyped will not just know religion, in a churchy way where they can get their shout on because the music was good on Sundays only. But that 
through our gifts and resources fused with technology and social media because that's the age we're in now. They will also know that God has empowered black folks and blessed us and made us a noble people from Senegal to St. Louis, from Ghana to the ghettos in the south and in the north. And that we too have a glorious history and future, just like all the other peoples of the world. What a grand vision to be a part of. With the time that I have left, I want to better see God's kingdom. We're kin, we're all kin in Jesus Christ. Coming on earth as it was already in heaven. And so as I prepare for that vision to come, I want to see better. So that I can inspire more persuasively. So that I can speak more prophetically. And serve with greater humility in a way that is loving and truthful and fearless and anointed by Jesus. Now that's my vision. What's your vision? Take a moment right now. Close your eyes and think about yourself. What is your vision? What is God's vision for your life? Where do you see yourself six months from now? What is God saying to you about you? What do you want to see? Th this desire to see God and God's working in the world is a good impulse with broad implications. And the child of God should have this vision impulse working in their souls. In other words, there should be something in you urging you to want to pursue and perceive your life and the potential of others more accurately, more graciously, more lovingly, more powerfully than you did two years ago before God allowed the earth to stand still and a radical disruption to occur. Because, and this is my first main point, and I don't have many, and each one is short, Sometimes, as was the case with Saul of Tarsus, as he made his way down the Damascus Road, God has to knock us off of our beast of travel and put us on our backsides as we sit on our assets. <laughs> so that we can then receive his expert medical attention so that our bad vision might be adjusted and become good vision. I believe that God knocked all of us off of our metaphorical donkeys, the entire global community, including the church, by allowing a natural disaster, really a viral evil, to bring us to a standstill. No, I don't think God caused it, but God allowed it. I don't think that God took delight in it because through the revelation of Jesus, God doesn't take delight in that kind of thing. But the fact of the matter is, in our fallen world, there is some chaos, some unpredictable events, what we would call accidents or tragedies, and the potential for natural and supernatural disasters abound, and then the devil gets busy. And if we live in the world, we live in a world that is both orderly and chaotic at the same time. It is rational sometimes. The sun keeps rising, or as the globe turns, it appears that the sun keeps rising the same way that it did the day before, but then there's chaos. Something pops up that seems irrational and random. But we can say with certainty that God did allow it. And perhaps God allowed it so that both saints and ain'ts might have an opportunity to have our vision corrected before we wreck our lives entirely. As deadly and as gut-wrenching as it was and still is globally, this pandemic, God allowed the pandemic. Perhaps God, because God saw that a strong warning was necessary to help us to better see the fragility of life. And to better see that racism is not dead, it's still alive. And that women still are not considered equals and that human existence is incomplete without folk leaning on God. I was discussing with someone recently the classic movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, from 1951. I'm talking about the original movie, not the 19 or the 2007 version. I don't remember. Keanu Reeves? No, I ain't talking about that one. 
I'm talking about the original classic, when the earth stood still, the day the earth stood still with, with Clay, Clay to the, the visitor from outer space, with his robot, Gort, I believe was the robot's name. I'm not sure about that. But he came, he was sent on an interplanetary mission, an interstellar mission to earth to give earth a warning. And it was during the period of the Cold War where nuclear war uh, buildup was just beginning to happen. And he was sent by other aliens to come to this earth and he came in a human form. And his warning was as he caused everything to stop on the earth. All technology stopped, all things mechanical stopped. And he had his robot with him. And he said, here's the deal. I am here as a warning and to see Will you all change? Because if not, my robot is here and he will destroy the entire planet. My God, my God. That's science fiction, but didn't the earth stand still for two years in many ways? It is interesting that this virulent virus, which started in the late 2019, 2019, grabbed the world and throat, or grabbed the world around the throat in 2020, which is the same year that a lot of so-called charismatic prophets of God were saying that 2020 is going to be the year of prophetic vision, a year that we're going to see more of what God has for us materially and socially. Now it seems that many of these so-called prophetic prognostications were off because they were too me, myself, and I oriented when this was a we moment. But maybe there was a kernel of truth prophesied about 2020 being the year that we need to get our spiritual visions checked out and analyzed and corrected. And this is not only true for us individually, but it is true for the church, including the Calvary Presbyterian Church of Detroit. We need to have a vision check and corrections. The times demand it. You know, I used to watch another show called Bar Rescue. It was on the... Um, I can't remember what network it was on, but the show was called Bar Rescue. And the basic premise of the show, starring a man named John Taffer, who had been a bar owner. I see, I see my dear sister Edwina nodding her head. He had been a bar and a club owner, and he had success in the past. He's an entrepreneur. He would come and stop by these bars that had applied for his help because these bars were struggling. These bars were not looking at how they were offering customer service and, and food and drinks and, and nourishment and uh, libations to the community. Where some of them were slovenly. Some of their bars and restaurants were just run haphazardly. The management was poor. John Taffer would come in and he would give him them his expert opinion. And do you know when he came in, a lot of folks couldn't stand him. Number one, he's kind of gruff and rough and off-putting. But he was usually right in his analysis. And if they were willing to make the changes John Taffer recommended, then he had money. He had uh, the, the ability to reconfigure and remodel their businesses. And usually after he got done, that business was ready for business. We live in that kind of age now, sisters and brothers. Think about the church. Do you usually look at the church the way guests might look at it when they come through the door? Just look around the sanctuary right now. What do you think guests see as they come in? Just take a moment. What do you think? This is a warm environment. A lot of good looking people here. Look to see what's on the walls. Are, are the walls giving us a unified message? Is, is the, 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 the stained glass window speaking to us? Is the way that we lead in worship, is the way that we greet those who come through the doors, is it welcoming? Does it make sense? These are all of the questions we've got to ask ourselves. God wants to grant us greater vision for our lives individually and a more biblical and gospel centered vision of what the church can do to assist in a changing world. Sisters and brothers, as you review your life, how open are you to allowing God to work on your eyesight? 
How open are you to God working on the cataracts of complacency or the glaucoma of spiritual gluttony? That's where we just come to receive the word. How open are you to God giving Calvary a new vision rooted in good founding principles? Saul was blind spiritually until he lost his sight physically. But after he lost his sight physically, Jesus met him at his point of vulnerability and desperation and confronted him and gave him a new vision, a brand new vision for his life. And as I take my seat, often like Saul, we cannot see what we need to see, which is a grand vision of what our purposes are and mission is until God comes along by God's word and spirit working through the Bible and servant leaders who are either foolish enough or bold enough and have enough vision enough to be willing to confront the powers of tradition and old ritual and, and, and stuck in the mud religion. That takes some courage. You know why? Because people usually suffer from inertia in the church. They don't want to move. They want things to remain the same. And sometimes we preachers can get like that as we age. We don't want to mess up things. We want things just to be as they are. But I hear the Holy Spirit saying that we have to change in order to be the people who God would have us to be as a church. We've got to be willing to confront and challenge and change the status quo as we hold on to our roots as a congregation. Are you willing to become vulnerable and uncomfortable as we lean on God and close our eyes to some of what has been and grope for and reach for a new vision, new possibilities? Because it is a new day which requires some new ways. God had a great future for Saul. Saul of Tarsus was transformed into the Paul the apostle of the church in this very text overnight he went from persecuting the church with every fiber of his being to supporting and edifying the church with every fiber of his being and the shift in his vision came because he had a new relationship with Jesus Christ that's my second and last point and Jesus gives his followers and friends whenever we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ Jesus gives us new vision Saul was delivered from his myopia so that he could see beyond those he hated to a ministry rooted in love. And from that day on, his vision was to tell the whole world, Jew and especially Gentile, he was a Jew. Through his pastoral epistles and his testimony and preaching, he was to tell the whole world, Jesus is Lord of all. And to this day, Paul has greatly impacted and is impacting millions upon millions upon millions of people over a 2000 year period. Africans and Europeans and Asians and Latinos have all been touched by the Paul by Paul's ministry and message. And it happened because God delivered Paul from a small parochial narrow vision, the limiting vision of his sectarian religious sect to a broad, dynamic, powerful, and everlasting vision, one born in the heart of God. A whole lot of folk didn't understand it, nor did they think God was in it, but if you have a vision from God, there will always be detractors. We've just got to listen to God. I think the same kind of call that was on Paul, Saul who became Paul, is on Calvary today. If all you can see is Calvary the way it was, your vision is too small. If all you can see is who the Presbyterians are and that it's, it means everything just to be a Presbyterian, and I'm saying that as one who's embracing Presbyterianism, but if that's your entire vision, your vision is too small. If all you can see is the same programs and the same relationships, the same people and the same family connections that have existed in the church for 30, 40, 50 years and continue to only impact a good 120 folk, good people, who are Calvary today, but if that's all you can see, your vision is too small. Why would a big God only grant small visions? 
God is the God of vision. And God is always trying to grant powerful vision because God knows best. And God can see farther than we can. God can see better than any other person or any other entity. And I believe, I'm just foolish enough to believe that our eyes have not seen nor our ears fully heard what wonderful things God has in store for his people in this church. As we live and ask together, God, give me a vision. May our hearts sing with the hymnal right, the hymn writer wrote. Lord, open my eyes that I might see. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me and us free. Silently now, I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes. Illumine me. Spirit divine. Maybe there's one here today. Your eyes have been opened this morning. You've heard the gospel. And you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, as I say every Sunday, and maybe I'll come up with a new saying next Sunday. <laughs> he will make your life brand new. What he's done for others, he will do for you and more. Won't you come and respond to the gospel and give your life to Jesus Christ? Allow him to be the Lord of your life. Maybe you've already done that. And now you want to recommit your life to Christ because you... Your vision has been messed up. You've been living out of a, a warped vision. Won't you come? Or maybe you just need a church home. We invite you to come. We invite you to call. Area code 313-537-2590. Call and make that commitment. Leave a message and our leaders will get back to you. Won't you come forward or call? Amen, amen again. We praise God for the invitation.